Okay, now that I'm not sure about. You, you want to give a presentation? Yes. Okay. The microphone. Does right. it connect up? Or? Well, we don't need to. Um, uh, we need to swap. Um, we, we sent a message on Telegram about our cartoons, so just check it out. I sent the code yeah. in Telegram and WhatsApp as well. So we so sent code, WhatsApp, and Telegram. Are you connected? Uh, do you have a connection? To the internet? Yeah. To, to Zoom? No. Should I connect uh, to, to, to Zoom? To, no, no, to internet. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. It's all good. Could you give your mail address to Nathanael? Yes. So, Nathanael, you can send the notification? No. Well, 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 well. Should I go and yeah? <laughs> <laughs> also for the people at home, <laughs> where's Kahoot? Kahoot? Um, is it Kahoot.com? Yeah. I think so. Yes. Um, for the ones at home, while we're setting up, you can go to uh, Kahoot. Dot com, I think. Dot it. Co .it. And enter the code. Well, we should write it somewhere. Uh, no, I, I wrote it in both groups, but sorry. we should also have it on the screen. Maybe I'm getting confused. But at some point, you need to connect your computer with this one. Yes, yes that's what I was asking. How do I? Yes, okay. So, so maybe it's going to plug mine. Uh, so just this one right all, here. Is this that one? one. Yeah. No, no, just, just before doing that. Could you come off soon? You know, it would be. Rejoin. I'm afraid it's going to be complex to switch from this. Unless you want to uh, put okay, your slide onto a USB yeah. and put it into my machine. But it's not a presentation. Ah, it's part it's of a Kahoot that. quiz. Okay, so we tried to make it fun. Alors, yeah. okay. On plug celui-ci? Okay. 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 Uh, I think it should be. Kind you, might have to re you might have to rejoin on Zoom, the people who are... They're still there. Okay, so yes, yeah. it's just to the projector. That yeah, port this is, is the just the code for those who didn't see okay. it. In the okay. So they can see it. Yes. Uh, there's people at home, so go to kahoot.it and then you enter this code above so you can join the presentation and some of the games. Or the. Uh, <laughs> so. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, okay. So, you so see class is there already? We'll wait a little. Go ahead. We'll wait a, one more second and then we can start. Um, so, welcome to the presentation part. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting paper. Absolutely, really enjoyed reading it. Wasn't expecting to because it, I thought it would be very law related, <laughs> and it is, but in a very, very fun sense. So, for those who didn't read it, I do recommend. Okay, that's the limit, I guess. Um, one interesting thing, we tried to do something fun with the Kahoot here, but however, because we are living in deep capitalism, everything is, you have to subscribe for, for it or pay for it, so we only have a demo version, which means we can't do as much of the fun things like that we pole. wanted to. Yeah. But we will do fun things nevertheless. So I'm sorry for those who can't join, I guess this is the <laughs> limit of players we have with the free version. With um, <laughs> But that is also... So, yeah, we can only do it as a quiz, but yeah. uh, there's no right answer. Um, but for the purpose of visuals, um, <laughs> when we do come up with a question, just raise your hand so we can see what your opinions are compared to each other and also so professor But also answer. See. Yeah. Um, but there, I put everything as a right answer because the questions are not, except for the first one, everything else is just an open-ended question, which we weren't able to do as an open-ended question. Because, as I said, capitalism. Okay, <laughs> so um, let's start with a very, or no, okay, let's start with a very basic question to kind of kick off the whole presentation, or no, okay. Um, so we're talking about employment and wage policies and how that relates to the post-neoliberal world. Um, I'm sorry. OK. 
Okay. Dobro, okay. We have a limit reached. All right. We get it. Okay, so we have a very simple question. Are institutions a key factor for the rise of inequality? And we have a true or false. This is the only... Okay, we get the limit. Oh, who, All right. Who thinks it's true? Uh, raise your hand. And also, but this one is going to actually give um, true and false answers. And from there, we get on to the first part. So the presentation is going to be divided in two parts, basically, where I kind of explain the theory behind some of the things in the paper, and then Gwendolyn and Angela... Great. Those who think it's false, you will see why it's not false. Um, and then Gwendolyn and Angela um, explain some of the other outcomes and what we can do in the future. Okay, this is just what. Okay, so capitalism is an instituted economic process. The idea here is that capitalism is able to exist and exists only in the way that institutions allow it to, which is the portrayal of institutions, which usually in the neoliberal world has been made in a way that we tend to view institutions as self organizing, meaning that they're kind of away from the reach of effective political action and effective political change. So for that, um, one example given in the paper, and I will also give it as well, is the World Bank example from 2008 when they say that worker laws usually tend to hurt workers rather than help workers, which can only exclusively be the case if we are in a system where institutions are not really helping you know, the people but the system itself. Um, so then from there we get to the market neutralization part, which is the idea that not only supply and demand meet and then we have the perfect equilibrium, but also the idea that um, in a way institutions work and capitalism works in a way that everything in the end will be neutralized for the laborers and for the workers' side, which of course we know is absolutely not true. So then we have three theories presented in the paper, um, which were also partly mentioned in um, the professor's presentation. The first one is the coerced theorem, um, which in theory, and or well, in simplified terms, um, kind of tries to explain that self-interest or the presentation of self-interest doesn't prom does promote um, economic welfare exclusively if institutions allow it to and make it in a way that it is that way, meaning that um, it kind of coerces you to try and be more interested in yourself and to try and be more individualistic because that is the only way that the system allows for more economic welfare of the individual and in return of the society, which, of course, horrible, but that is what it is. Then we go to the legal origins theory, which is the comparison of the common versus the civil law, uh, mostly known as the UK or uh, French and German laws. Uh, I will not go into detail on the legal basis, but definitely an important part in understanding how, how institutions, especially how labor laws have been developed um, throughout the years and throughout how capitalism has been developed as well. And then finally getting to Poliani's double movement, which was also just mentioned at the end of the presentation, which in very simple terms um, talks about how capitalism undergoes cycles of embedness and disembedment um, in a way that um, includes many crises along its, its way, of course, um, but also still remains a very instituted economic process, meaning that regardless of whether we're in the embedded or disembedded stage, whether we're in deep crisis or not, we are still very much embedded into the institutional forces behind it. So this leads us, um, can I go next, great. This leads us to two questions which form part of the second chapter of the paper, which is institutions and inequality, which will now answer why inequality is, or why institutions are a key player in increasing inequality. The first question is if legal and other formal uh, institutional processes play a central role in constituting and shaping capitalism, what is their connection to inequality? And here is where we explain a lot of Piketty's and Milanovic's and Kuznets' ideas, which will be more explained later on by my colleagues. So I will now go to the second question directly, which is why exactly should we expect labor, mar sorry, labor market institutions such as collective bargaining and social insurance to lead to the convergence of incomes? So the idea behind this, or the answer that we get from the chapter, is that um, the changes that we have seen in corporate and tax laws, especially in the 70s and 80s of the last century, uh, uh, combined with the wage and employment laws that have been very deteriorating for the labor force, have led to a time where um, institutions are the ones that are directly responsible for the increase of inequality. Because if we see that inequality has been highly linked to how laws have been regulated, how corporations and taxes have modified, how labor and, it, sorry, how labor and, um, and wages have been tackled by law, then we can easily see the link between the two, which I really like in the quote put in the paper, which says, the laws of the market are just that, politically instituted and as much economic 
and what can be done politically can be undone, which is absolutely true, but that links us to the next point, why this is so hard to do and why not only have we tried or are still trying to do it, but are kind of failing miserably, but also that there is a way not to fail, however, the system itself is set up in a way that it <laughs> inevitably must fail. So this is the next chapter called The Maling Spirits of Contemporary Capitalism. So what are these uh, Maling Spirits? I'm sorry, can you see them? Um, what are these Maling forces? They are speculations that overtake production as the dominant mode of rational behavior. This I will explain a bit more through the idea of tax havens, um, which of course was um, tackled uh, largely by the professor in, this, in their presentation. Um, so what we have come to see with tax havens and with the rise of tax havens is that um, countries are basically in competition to one another um, with the idea of inviting more capital inflows and with the idea of enriching the capitalist system in which they are in. And so the roles of tax havens have basically led to the creation of law as a commodity, not only as an institutionally represented idea. Uh, and commodifying law or making it a product is a seriously problematic scenario in the very globalized world that we live in because what it initially leads to is just households and corporations which are of higher income or, or of higher wealth and prosperity to be able to use um, the benefits of globalization in a way that no one else in the society or the system can. So then this is a way of tricking law or tricking the, the right of law or the power of law moreover into personal benefit and, of course, um, gain. So <laughs> what then we also have is the deterioralization of rules in labor, um, which can really be explained as well with, for example, the European Union. We have a single joint market, right? But still within the market, there are countries like Ireland, like the Netherlands, like Luxembourg, that are um, tax havens in itself, which then lead both the labor force and the, the corporations to have this freedom, which the actual worker doesn't really have. And then that is what makes law itself an increasingly seen product. So as a conclusion of this part of the paper, the idea is basically that as people have, um, as in institutions have changed the way that capitalism is created um, through the laws that have been proposed, both for taxation and corporations and for wages and employment, that together with the distrust which is increasing for the past many, many years from um, the people's side towards the institutions, we are going into a period of inequality which or are actually in it, the period of inequality, which can't really be returned back, which leads to my point from the previous slide that it is a political thing that can be politically undone, but the increasing distrust and the de decreasing power that the people have or mm. the workers have or the, what we are all trying to present here has um, doesn't actually lead to any change. It just leads to kind of the same thing going on and on again. That is for my part. Um. <laughs> so um, now we're going to go into uh, some of the um, approaches that were discussed in the paper. Um, there was there were three um, major um, uh, authors that were discussed. Uh, their approaches discussed. So at the top here we have the approaches of taxation and transnational assemblies, which was uh, discussed by Piketty. And in the paper, basically. Um, this inequality um, could be addressed by the taxation and uh, global wealth uh, and also with uh, transnational assemblies. So using that wealth, um, taxing that wealth to, to uh, address educational inequalities, basically redistribute wealth. And then um, Atkinson in 2015 discussed the social state um, sort of citing more of the successes of the mid 20th century, but this is, um, the critique here is that it was really one off and it, it may not be relevant to the times. Um, and then the third one would be Mil Milanovic, um, which was about orderly migration in a, in a time of globalization. But um, the critique there is that um, this approach of um, sort of like a, a limited citizenship where the migrant would get less benefits from the state or like higher taxes, um, it's already happening. So um, there's no discussion really of how ILO would act as a coordinating body and also for, 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 for taxation and transnational assemblies, what would be the role of um, ILO. So these were um, some of the approaches discussed in the, um, in the paper. 
And so, in your, if, uh, given that, um, which, not saying that any of them are correct, but which one would you most agree with? So who of you agree that wealth and taxation, breaking up capital, redistributing wealth would be the best approach? Anybody? You can answer on your cahoots <coughs> or raise your hand. And the second one would be, is Atkinson's social state creating conditions for the convergence of wealth? Would this be the most appropriate? I mean, all of them might not be. <laughs> and then the last one is Milanovic's orderly migration redefinition of citizenship. Anybody agree? We're probably not. Oh, you do. Okay, so we have one. Um, so, okay. <laughs> you want me to stay and change the slides? Yes, uh, sure. Can you have space chaos? Sorry. Sure, why not? Okay. What do you mean by social conditions? Because it looks, it sounds so generic if you ask me. Social conditions like? It would be, well, I'm not the expert, but this would be <laughs> time to ask him what he it's meant. Actually, social sense creating um, uh, conditions for the convergence of work, like just one example of such conditions. Like, um, for example, um, creating like allowances for those who are who are poor, or the conditions for them to get allowances, like in the case of, say, Brazil, um, they created, um, uh, what is that, um, the Familia, Bolsa Familia, Familia, things like that to... Okay. And the Bolsa Familia will likely be funded with taxation, so we are back to other, the first part. Yes. Which well, is taxation to so redistribute wealth. No, it wasn't respond to taxation. They just spent more. Or is it is it by the who who funds it? What funds it? Yeah. Yeah. Part of the GDC. Get like a in time frame. You first decide what you spend, and they said, "Well, we spend this money to both a family," and then later at the end of the year, you see if you. You got taxation for it, yeah. So that's how it works. I mean, you don't decide on taxes before, and uh, they didn't increase taxes after only because of this. They what? Didn't increase taxes after because they implemented both the familia the year before. They didn't do this. Okay. And then um, next, there's a discussion of stabilizing employment relationships. So here. There's the um, discussion on the employment model and then the gig and platform economy models. So the reason why um, <laughs> it's encouraged the gig and platform economy is that it increases flexibility and innovation, while on the employ model, employment model that we know, um, it's stable, um, there's fiscal stability, and it's actually the basis for a lot of policies, which we'll discuss later, but the issues that need to be addressed with both is, for example, with the gig and the platform economy, there's no minimum wage benefits, and the workers are actually, they have a relationship with, say, an app, or um, instead of an actual enterprise, or, um, so their, their work is tied to an algorithm. And then with, um, with the employment, <laughs> We have to face the issue that there will be a, that there is a rise in the gig economy and and um, uh, other types of employment. So on this on this quiz or not this quiz but this poll, which type of platform do you think needs to be regulated the most? So um, you can raise your hand. E-commerce. Anybody think that e-commerce should be regulated the most? Okay. Amazon. Uh, like Amazon, Mercado Libre, uh, ride sharing, delivery. Freelance platforms, and then there's uh, freelance platforms, anybody? Uh, manual labor, domestic labor platforms. Okay, so um, so those are some, some forms. And so here we're just showing Uber that there has been like so, some literature and some protests. There's some links here that you can learn about some of the stuff going on. I'm sure there's stuff going on in all your countries. But basically the most striking uh, headline I saw was your boss is an algorithm by New York Times and they discuss how that is the case for many Uber drivers. Next one. <laughs> so which one, if you were, uh, which one would you prioritize for platform companies? Do you think that they should be tax greater? Anybody? Uh, employee benefits such as health, uh, prioritize that? Anybody think that? Okay. 
Uh, minimum wage. Okay. Ceilings on work hours. Okay. So there. But it's a zero. It's a tie between <laughs> minimum wage. <laughs> okay. Great. And so this slide now, just a summary on this. So um, what's the trend? I mean, employment contracts have to stay, essentially, because a lot of the policies are kind of like, um, they rely on the stability of the employment contracts. So um, they need to stay. And basically the paper says, and correct me if I'm wrong, is if anything that sort of degrades the stability of the employment contract will also uh, contribute to inequality. So um, it's, it's wise to preserve it, but also create policies that sort of uh, temper, temper this, that it doesn't degrade the employment contract too much. So next slide. And so Bolsa Familia, it's, well, I, I put this up here, there's links there. There was a great discussion on, um, on, on this program from an economics and social standpoint, meaning, you know, um, you, it's like investing in human capital for the future by uh, giving them allowances, giving them benefits, so to close that inequality gap. And then um, one of the critiques that I was, this is outside the paper, <laughs> but I did, I did like find some videos on it, is that um, it is, it's not the, like a one, a, like a, it's a great solution for now, but there's so much more to be done structurally in the economies because still at the end of the day, the rents from the big companies, it's not being addressed. So um, that was one of the main critiques that was very striking to me, but you can go ahead and watch more, or maybe the Brazilians have, yeah, okay. later. Now, <laughs> last quick question to engage you guys. So imagine you're a policymaker in a country, you want to address inequalities, and you have a couple of policies avail available. Which one would you set like the first? Would you immediately go to minim minimum wage? Would you say, okay, let's see international standards, for example, ILO, to compile my laws with them, so I could maybe participate in trade more often? Or, for example, see, okay, what's the state of laws at this moment? How many labor inspectors do we have? Uh, how's the corruption going? Like, should we address that first and then? So, mm -hmm. I will first. International labor standards. <coughs> no? Rome? <laughs> <Bro? laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, never mind. Sam has a question. No, because since two thirds of your group, they come from the Balkans, I'm sure that you know that us being in line with international labor standards and international standards, we know. <laughs> <laughs> Like domestic market is the one that should be regulated more because a lot of people don't take into account any international uh, principles, so they just behave in their own accordance. Also, ILO standards are not compulsory. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> okay, starting off with the minimum wages, uh, it's usually when speaking of addressing inequalities, the hot topic. And especially when we talk about neoliberal paradigm, uh, saying that, okay, if we increase minimum wage, it's going to increase in employment because we are increasing costs for the employer and people usually living off the minimum wage are the most risky ones, so they're going to be the most affected. So that policy is just going to increase inequality, not going to reduce it. Neoliberal <laughs> solution, just let the growth be and eventually everyone will be well off. But in the paper, we were shown the examples of both UK and USA, where the minimum wage as a social po as a policy was introduced, then reintroduced during the last century at the beginning of this one, resulting in UK setting it 2016, finally the minimum wage set. And it showed a couple of things, uh, but most importantly, it showed the weakness of sectorial collective bargaining, the first, and the need to increase the wage floor. But with other given examples, both in the paper and the practical evidence we have, we know that neoliberal story that it's not as effective and, and it has negative effects doesn't really hold and should be like crucial at the policy targeting inequalities, but followed up with extensive legal mechanisms, for example. So, yes, next question. Now, find a good example from Montenegro. This was my little proud moment. <laughs> Uh, because 
uh, we have the quote from the president of Trade Union Association of Montenegro, just to paint the picture how the labor market structure is at the moment. So basically, after 30 years of one government, we had a new one two years ago, who finally set social policies targeting inequality and using the minimum wage as an instrument of doing so. So after 30 years, I mean, 12 years, I think, of living off the minimum wage, 200 euros, we got to 450. But still, you can see how the toll goes. And just to remember two things, <coughs> Montenegro has one of the top 10 wealthiest presidents <laughs> in the world, the first. And second of all, uh, we have a little bit over half a million people in general. So yes, uh, seeing this as a policy of targeting inequality was quite refreshing. But I've mentioned legal mechanisms, so we can continue. To see one other thing that's crucial, and this, which is public enforcement of labor laws, could it be civil laws, could it be inspections or criminal fines? Uh, the example we have is the USA after the 80s, when we had the regulation of labor laws. What also happened is that the disputes between employer and employee went from general court to employer-led private arbitrage, which of course led to politicization of the whole process and a more, more hostile jurisdiction. Now, yes, if I got you excited that Montenegro is going to be new Uruguay, no, uh, don't get too excited. Uh, basically what's happening after the new law was set for the minimum wage is that the huge employers who I mean, usually employ people on the minimum wage uh, got creative and found ways to avoid the law. Some of those ways were <coughs> Uh, getting new contracts for the people, so moving from full-time to part-time, or since making a new contract is a, a little bit of a hustle, why just not bla blackmail employees and give them full salary on their bank account and then expect, I mean, demand of them to, do so, to return the difference in cash, right? which is the more common practice. So if you're wondering, well, why is this happening? Why are people not saying anything rather than going to court? Because they're not protected by the law. Uh, this whole situation is one-on-one employer-employee. It means employee to say something to go with the evidence to the court, I mean with his statement, which could be used as an evidence. But people don't use <laughs> do so because uh, protection of those whistleblowers or insiders is quite weak in Montenegro. And then yet again we have problem with corruption and corrupted labor inspectors and so on, making it the enforcement of public law as one of the maybe even more crucial steps of this now. Now, uh, going to the Rome cohort favorite, or the evolution of ILO. Is this song? Carry on talking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the evolution of ILO. So first, uh, we know what we had, the first globalization that stopped in the around uh, 1914 with the First World War. And then the formation of ILO and the Versailles Treaty saying that labor laws are human, uh, lab labor rights are human rights, meaning no more child labor, no more uh, equal opportunities for men and women, uh, health and safety set as a priority on work and so on. And then from the second globalization to present, the focus, at least in paper, was set more to the trade agreements between countries and the ILO's role in that. Uh, basically, so I think the developing and developed countries on equal foot when it comes to labor standards, they should uh, all the respect. So uh, enforcing that through trade and making the labor market more regulated and more fair for others and reducing inequality in that sense. Now, I hope you found this interesting, but we have uh, yes, questions now. First, for the Professor Deakin, and once again, thank you for your presentation. And okay. Um, so the first question would be for you, Professor, but also for everyone, I guess, and what everyone thinks. Um, what would your understanding of the future of labor law be? How do you see everything that we've said so far develop? Um, well, um, actually, it's okay if I put it over here. So 
firstly, thank you very much indeed for the um, discussion point. That's really helpful to me. And uh, actually, I, I realise there's, there's a lot in the paper, of course, I didn't put into the presentation. But uh, the paper was actually written, I should say, in response to a kind of brief from the editors of the book in which it appeared to write about policy. So in a way, it was assumed that we could have a policy debate. But of course, you're absolutely right. The predominant theory has been that institutions are self-organising and there's almost nothing we, we can do to change things. I, I think that increasingly social scientists don't accept that. Um, and that um, the argument has shifted to the other point you made absolutely, which is, okay, we can change things uh, institutionally, but it's impossible to get political agreement. The barriers to resolving the collective action problem are simply, simply too great. So at least the debate's moved on a little bit to say we can imagine uh, a different way of regulating the economy. Now it's a question of trying to understand better maybe to endogenize the political process, as Kuznets and Lewis originally did. So does capitalism, by its own nature, produce a pushback against um, extreme forms of the market? Polanyi's notion of a double movement would say, well, capitalism, he says, it's my very final slide, needs regulation. I think he said something like, um, nobody can live with the complete free market. And the market is not the same as capitalism. And he goes on to say, um, even, well, capitalists need the central bank to save them in the same way that workers might need, he then said the factory acts, okay, but we'd say the whole of labour law is needed to protect labour. Capital isn't a natural phenomenon any more than labour is. They're both instituted. And Polanyi was really saying that although the regulatory forms may, to some degree, fragment, they may dissolve, uh, because capitalism is very protean, it's always somehow changing its form, isn't it? So regulation has to change. So the notion of a double movement, we think about a cycle of regulation that worked in the middle decades of the 20th century and then stopped working. So the answer to the first question is, what is the future of labour law? We've reason to believe, um, at, at, a, at a deep theoretical level, uh, that public regulation, law, institutions, both private and public, are essential to the functioning of capitalism. And as long as there is capitalism, and there may not be forever, there's still scope for a double movement back to some sort of stronger labor law. So the future of labor law, I would say, to answer that question, is it will always have a future as long as there is capitalism. This may seem contradictory. Surely protecting workers is nothing to do with capitalism. It's contradicting capitalism. But actually, capital needs labor. Um, employers need workers to receive a wage so they can consume the products which firms make and so on. However, I want to qualify that straight away. It's not always in the interests of each individual enterprise for there to be labour regulation. Each individual enterprise wants other enterprises to pay the minimum wage. Each enterprise is happy for other employers to obey the rules, so it can sell its products, but it may want to be the enterprise which is exempted from them, which has the right, as all capitalist firms want, to buy low and sell high. That's how capitalist firms survive. So the collective action problem is, these rules are even in the interests of capitalists. It's rather like the evolutionary psychology paper that says, even the wealthy are unhappy, okay, in very unequal societies, even they should be in favor of living in a more egalitarian society. But practically, the collective action problem, the prisoner's dilemma, these problems are inherent as well within capitalism, especially if we believe in the kind of ideology of choice. Freedom to choose is freedom to opt out. Freedom to defect, isn't it? That's why we have tax evasion, tax regulation, all those things. Tax evasion, regulatory arbitrage, would make no sense if somebody wasn't somewhere obeying the regulations. Right. We talk about enterprise zones. They're also now very popular in the UK and in other countries too, in India, for example. Well, having an enterprise zone only makes sense if somebody else is obeying the rules. Right. So I'm not completely pessimistic about the future. Of, of course, I understand that labour law didn't come about because of an argument like that. Okay. The argument might have justified and explained what happened, but labour laws were only made by yeah, people really being prepared to struggle and fight for those laws. That's absolutely right, isn't it? 
So they, they are not self-enacting and they are not self-forming. But the argument that they're fundamentally against the nature of capitalism is not one that I feel we should accept. Now, of course, I understand that there may be and should be a debate about not just post-neoliberalism, but post-capitalism. Okay, but that's another debate. Okay, <laughs> this is an argument about what comes after neoliberalism in a framework that's still broadly capitalist. And whether this leads to an evolution away from capitalism is a slightly different question. Not one I, I addressed in the paper. But sure, I, I think labor law not only has a good past, but has a future as well, despite all the difficulties. Yeah. Okay. So that leads into the crowd. second one. Yes. Anybody about this? Uh, I'm very curious about the, the objective of labor law because um, I could just act and say, okay, I'm representing my country, Nigeria, for example, yeah. and there's um, a high level of unemployment, but the fact that there's the existence of the gig economy gives me flexibility with my work. Sure. Um, let's assume I'm, I've been a graduate for four years, unemployed, and then finally I have access to internet. Uh, I could be a content creator, I could be working for capitalists in the US, blah, blah, blah. But I'm earning wealth. I'm feeding my family. I'm also able to um, participate in the market back at home and also like buy things from the informal market, blah, blah, blah. Um, and even if I get fired tomorrow by the person who employed me, I could look out for another freelance work tomorrow on the same platform yeah, and yeah. just keep going. So um, it's important for me to understand the objective of labor law. Um, Yes, we talk about protection, but in the, in the end, even when there are no strong labor laws, it gives one the opportunity of assessing opportunities in a country like mine. So if my country decides to put something very stringent, then it affects me from getting freelancing jobs that have kept me and my family going, in that sense. So um, what's the objective of, of the labor law, maybe domestically, and then how can, I don't know, how could, maybe, how could we improve the experience of those who freelance? and out into economy. I think that's With connected this. to the second question as well because the, the goal the goal of labor law is unclear. It's like yeah. for productivity. So that's why we pose the question as so well. The, the uh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. 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 So you also mentioned the example of Hubert. I would be curious to see, according to you, where lies the, the power of trade union today to like improve working conditions and like target inequalities. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. Now um, platform work um, often is. Uh, wage labour. Okay, the platforms will say they're just intermediaries, but often they are employers. Uber is really an employer running a transportation business, but not, not every platform is. So, so some forms of um, uh, platform work don't involve a wage relationship. Uh, that's, that's, that's obvious. Not every transaction is going to fall within the scope of labour law. But I think that people working on a regular basis for a platform like Uber, uh, even Amazon Turk, something like that, need protection. Sometimes it can come with rights against the employer. In some cases, gig workers need social insurance. In informal labour markets, this is not just the, the case of Nigeria. Nigeria has a growing gig economy, but also a large informal economy. I've written elsewhere that really social insurance should be the first step to formalise a very informal middle income country economy. And it's not right to impose the labour laws of, say, Germany or France immediately for a developing economy. Absolutely not. So it's not an argument to impose Western costs upon middle-income countries. But ILO labor standards don't do that. They're mostly minimum standards, and they're procedural and generic. Um, by the way, of course they're not enforceable, but often they end up being enforced in the end when they're put into trade agreements or when they're implemented at domestic level. And I actually think the, the strength of the ILO is its soft power. That's why it's now get, gaining legitimacy. The WTO, which works through really hard sanctions, can't get everybody to agree on a multilateral trade agreement, partly because of that. Trade unions in Uruguay. Uruguay is an important and interesting case because there's hardly any law underpinning collective bargaining there, but a very strong social consensus in favour of collective bargaining and one union federation. So limiting competition between trade unions, solidarity across trade unions uh, is really important. It's a small country, it's a small labour market, and it's not quite a nation, it's not quite um, a city-state, 
but it almost is. Okay, Montevideo is by far the largest city. So when we think of Uruguay, you should probably really be thinking more in terms of uh, Switzerland, Sweden, or even Hong Kong, actually, a city-state structure. That won't work for many countries. But there are lots of things that, that can be done, and I'm sorry we've run out of time and I can't talk about them all, but <laughs> hopefully the paper will trigger um, further, um, I don't know, interest or reflection. Um, and if, I'm very happy to answer emails or follow up later. Okay. Anyone? Okay. Yes, I think we just, yeah, the, the trade unions and, so my argument about Uruguay, as, as I just said, was, you know, is, is the, the, um, the fact that you can get consensus in a country, not even much law, okay, uh, but very difficult for employers who are going to be shamed if they don't follow labour standards. Now, that was the UK model until about 1980, okay. So Uruguay is a Latin American country, a civil law regime um, in, in the South American context, but its system is like that of Denmark today, actually, or Britain until 1980, I would say. Yeah, is it time to answer one more question or two? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes, uh, the gentleman at the back, I think, was supposed to add on that, that, uh, that's the result of over 100 years of very strong institutions. Sorry, I'm your wife. That's the result of over 100 years right. of very strong That's right. It's very long lived. That's right. So, you and we, we, we managed in 1913, yes. maybe eight-hour shift in 1908. So, like, actually, from what I've read, the Scandinavian countries went to Uruguay in the 1910s, 20s to get inspired by our like proto welfare state. That's absolutely right. So Uruguay was the it's first like country, a long that's tradition. right, <laughs> One, almost the first country in the world to have working time laws of that sort. The first in South America, certainly. And what was a beacon of labor protection? That's absolutely right. So these are very long-lived. No, no system is perpetually um, sealed in, I think, from the sort of neoliberal argument. But U Uruguay absolutely is, is a country that's worth studying for European labor laws. We also lost the collective bargaining in the, after the dictatorship. We lost it in, I know. in the 90s. That's you right. have growth. It came back. Growing inequality, and it came back with the left wing government in 2005. So that's you actually actually have a period of like you, you did. economics. That's actually. right. And it ended. That's right. So, so this is going to, needs to be encouraged by developments all the way across South America, not just the Bolsa Familia, but in Brazil, collective bargaining was strengthened by the Lula administration. It, it, was, it wasn't just social security, it was labor law as well. That's, that's, that, that's absolutely correct. Now, the, the, the sto yeah, so really the story of Uruguay is important for global labor law, I, I, I would say. It's not just a story of Germany, Britain, and France. Um, it's important to understand that labor law was actually stronger in South America in the first half of the 20th century than anywhere else in the world. Europe is today where it's strongest, but it's, it's, it was stronger in South America in that period as well. Yeah. Yes? Um, I, I, I want to come back to, to corporations and inequalities because after the end of the, of the transgular years, we have seen an increase in financialization and the rise of globalization, and we can agree that has had negative effects on both labor rights and on the social equality. So, as we are witnessing right now, we are living in the pro in a process of deglobalization. So, can we assume that there will be also an inc a decrease in financialization and subsequently an increase in labor rights? in a more dynamic labor law sector. We can't assume it, but, but we, we are seeing disenchantment with globalization. And that disenchantment is, in the short term, takes the form of populism um, in many countries and, and a threat to democracy. Right. That, that, that type of populism is successful in a context where uh, liberal democracies went overboard on neoliberalism. And there was a lot of faith and legitimacy, really, for the system. There's also some disenchantment with things like the International Labour Organization because they couldn't stop some of the negative consequences of globalization, nor could the EU in the European context. That's why we have Brexit. So the response to deglobalization could be, sure, uh, a new authoritarianism, it could be uh, populism um, and the revival of a culture war. We see that everywhere. Right. We have to remember that the ILO was founded in 1919 to encourage a certain type of globalization. The, maybe it was a dream that you could globalize on the basis of universal labor standards. 
But that was the aim, it wasn't anti-globalization. Mm. So the idea of a global economy which levels up, again, we, must, we mustn't lose that, is thanks to globalization that we see such a large growth in the middle class outside the global north. That's why the Gini coefficient globally did fall. So a type of globalization that just shuts off the wealthy countries from everywhere else is not really in anybody's interests. But to achieve globally the kind of stable institutions which operate only in certain countries at the moment is clearly a very difficult task. I think that what is incumbent upon researchers to explore the institutional conditions that, make, that might make that possible. Okay. In, in our professional lives, that's our job. Right. Um, as activists or whatever else we may be, in what time we have left after writing all this stuff and doing all this research, we may need to do other things, sure. Research won't do it, do it on its own. But I, I, I do think it's an important part of the process. So understanding what went on in the past, what did work, and what might work again is an important part of this. Yes? I have, I have two questions because we are mentioning the strengthening of the labor laws. But what about the role of the reindeers in the sense that um, what's the role of that? Because if, the, if they stay there, um, they are going to have like uh, access to, to government and this lobbying power. So that's on one side. And, and so I would like to know what are, like, if, it's go, if it goes gap, uh, hand in hand with the strengthening of the labor law. And the other question is that uh, for the future, I wonder if you really believe that this Polandian backlash could happen if there is not, um, uh, I don't know, like the uh, USSR or something, which is uh, actually, I think that the process of more labor power, um, ber more bargaining power, it is due that there is a menace, so there's something that could happen, like Europe can become communist. So, if, but I don't mean like exactly like, um, I, I just mean like, if there is not an open political uh, class conflict, because I think that the paper is really clear, and I do agree with the central message of more regulation, that this goes hand in hand with institutions, that the market cannot be the only institution. I completely agree, but I wonder about the possible uh, social blocks that can lead this new uh, regulation. Yes, it's so, so the regulation isn't really endogenous to capitalism. It's got to be fought for and argued for. It doesn't just happen, that's absolutely right. But capitalism might produce conditions which are favorable to re-regulation at certain points in time. And commonly, if we're talking about okay, a capitalist framework, the capitalists themselves have to be convinced. The employers have to be convinced to go along with collective bargaining. They have to support social insurance in the early decades of the 20th century for it to happen. Governments don't just represent the labor interest, they also represent the rentier or capital interest. That's absolutely right. So it is, part of it is persuading people, and maybe you're right, uh, they're very wealthy, the rentier class, were prepared to tolerate the welfare state when they, the, they thought the alternative was the Soviet Union. Yes, that's entirely possible. So the Bolshevik Revolution may have triggered the ILO's founding and constitution, as well as World War I. It wasn't just the war. It wasn't just the fact that class conflict also led to international conflict. Yes, it was fear of the, the Soviet model. I'm, I'm sure that's part of it. And the end of the Soviet alternative has made it easier for governments in the West to deregulate and to, and to liberalize. But I do think it's just that. Okay, there were labor laws before 1917. Okay, we talk about Uruguay. It's also the case that labor laws in Western Europe predate the, the foundation of the Soviet Union. So it wasn't just the threat of the Soviet model which prompted social reform in Western Europe and North America in that period. I do think we need to recreate um, a, a threat like the Soviet one. There are lots of other threats to well-being in the West, the global North today, and elsewhere, which might convince <coughs> some elites. Okay, there'll always be people who oppose this, and in particular, there'll always be academic currents of thought which oppose it. They also need to be addressed and countered. That's what I feel I can do. But the wider argument, I completely agree. If you want to take these arguments out of the classroom and put them into practice, that is not going to be easy. Okay, um, however, uh, the alternative to some sort of revived democratic socialism is clearly going to be not neoliberalism now, not, not some sort of extreme market libertarianism, maybe not, okay, maybe in the UK for the next few weeks or months it might be. But the alternative is not that, is it? The alternative is, is a culture war and author, authoritarian politics. That's what we're looking at, yeah. So we have no choice but to try and make it work, I think. 
Sorry, yes. Me? Okay, yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation. Also, thank you, Brian, Angela, and Kalina. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my question is a bit theoretical, sorry. But um, I, I study Polony, and um, I'd like to listen to your view on Polony and where this comes from, because um, in Polony, there is no cycle. Yeah, he wrote the book in 1944. So it was before, so he wasn't expecting a cycle of things repeating. He believed in a better world. Mm -hmm. he, he thought that things would be better after. But he, there is no, uh, in his book, there is no trend of like things always going, coming back. And this is actually a big discussion now Polonia, mm -hmm. now Polonians, Polony, Polonians, because they're going to discuss, okay, are things embedded now or disembedded? Um, and I don't know, it seems that in the Great Transformation, the parameters that Polanyi uses to say that economy is disembedded, I don't think they were totally recovered after the Second World War. And then um, the point is, Polanyi doesn't look what is inside the, the, the double movement, yes, the, the reaction movement. It's just for him, it's natural, yeah? it emerges from the, from the society as a response to democratization. And then the discussion nowadays, for example, I think Nancy Fraser does a very good discussion, uh, even bringing the, the uh, triple movement idea, uh, is that, for example, social movements nowadays are way more disorganized, for example. Workers' movement was way more organized back then. And uh, so when you look today, capitalism is very good to take over these movements and even separate, put like workers' movements against environmental movements and put them to fight against each other in some way. So how do you see that this double movement actually happens? Because this, is, I think, is on the basis of your optimism and on the basis of our uh, not so much optimism. So, <laughs> so I, I, I think Polanyi obviously didn't, didn't, uh, wasn't able to see the unraveling of the welfare state. Um, but there are many aspects of his thesis I don't agree with. Um, I, I don't really agree that in any sense the Industrial Revolution in England was brought about by some sort of deregulation and, uh, and there was re-regulation later. Um, but I've written about this on the English case, but there was regulation before the, um, the Industrial Revolution. The poor law, the proto-social insurance law, goes back to the 17th century. And, and many historians now believe it was responsible for England's early industrialization. So England was spending more on social security on, on the poor law than France did by several orders of magnitude. And this was a way of dealing with risk. Labor law is a risk uh, management mechanism, and so social, social security law, which is part of capitalism. So having a large public sector, the English poor law was public law. They actually actively suppressed charitable giving, and the state organized it. Right, okay. There never was a capitalism without the state being involved in some way. But probably Kalecki might be a better reference point than Polanyi to explain how the post-war consensus was Unraveled. Remember, 1944-45, Kalecki wrote a paper suggesting that although at that point the economics profession believed in Keynesian policies and demand management, it wouldn't take long before a significant body of economists challenged it, as the Chicago School did from the 60s onwards. And that's where we are now. There, there was this fundamental challenge. Um, and I guess the point here would be that institutional forms uh, can calcify, can become over rigid, don't always change in response to their context or environment. Capitalism is always somehow shape shifting, isn't it? And labour law maybe is catching up to that extent. But the idea that you can do without that form of risk management, I, I don't think is, is consistent with virtually any theory of capitalism one might meant to have, other than a kind of extreme libertarianism that we see with Hayek. So, Polanyi, I don't agree with everything in Polanyi. Um, and I don't think we should literally take everything that Polanyi wrote as a truth. I think it's like any other author of, of, of that stature, that we need to interpret their work for our own time. And I appreciate there's a debate about what exactly he meant by, by many of these things, but I think we should use his work you know, creatively, but depart from it when, when necessary, actually. But then don't you think that the social movement part is missing nowadays? So, well, I, I think we see lots of social movements, but we don't yet see uh, in many countries, the public instituting of, of a response to capitalism as, as we did in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, and 40s. But I think that will come. Um, I think that's all part of the process. As I said, the reason I believe this is capitalism itself, the capitalists need public regulation. And this, is, I think, is a weakness of their position, which is that we don't need the state. Of course, they, they need the state, they need the state to do certain things. So neoliberal economic philosophy, or libertarianism as a political philosophy, its main purpose 
is to hide what the state really does okay, and call it libertarianism. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm afraid we someone need to stop there. Okay. You know, yeah, <laughs> yes, uh, so uh, thank you very much everyone and thank you Simon for this. Thank you. Thank you.